I'm Lucy Shea, I'm the CEO of Futera, and I couldn't be more excited about this panel. After 20 years of working on sustainability, sustainability strategies and communications, I can honestly say I think this climate solutions framework is one of the unlocks we need at this moment in order to scale climate solutions and displace the high uh, fossil fuel, high carbon emitting Welcome. Come on, good. that's just perfect timing. We're just still on the intro. Hi. Um, displays high carbon emission products and services with these climate solutions. All right, so Kaya, that was great timing because I was about to introduce the panel. That's so nice. yeah, um, what we'll do is we're going to start with a little Q&A uh, with Johan Falk, uh, who's the CEO and co-founder of Exponential Roadmap. And then we have this stellar panel of practitioners, climate solutions companies, um, uh, academics, and so we've got Carolyn Reed, who's the Sustainability Director, EMA of Oatly. We've got Lena, I'm going to get this right, Hawkins' daughter. Thanks! <laughs> Chief Sustainability and Corporate Affairs Officer at Stegra. We've got Piera Patrizio, Head of Research, Science-Based Targets Initiative. We should have one more panelist coming, uh, Zainab B, who's the Asia Pacific Climate Campaign Manager for Equal Rights. So that's right, leave a space for Zainab. And we have Kaya Axelson, who's the Head of Policy and Partnerships and Research Fellow, Oxford Net Zero, University of Oxford. Could we please give them a warm round of applause? All right, so moving to the content. Johan, why have you developed the Climate Solutions Framework? Ta-da, with the slides. Uh, yes. Is it, yeah, good. No, tech team, we need some slides. Right. Yeah, we got it, thanks. Climate Solutions Framework. Well, firstly, about the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, we bring together leading transformers and disruptors with the common mission to have emissions by 2030 through exponential climate action and solutions. So that's who we are. And um, uh, the foundation for our initiative is, is the carbon law, that we basically need to have emissions every decade from 2020 20 to half by 2030 and every decade after that while protecting nature and uh, scaling up carbon removals. But we know that we are still moving in the wrong direction. One reason for that, as far as we see it, is that we're not scaling up uh, the solutions which will shift out the fossil economy sufficiently fast and exponentially. So that's really the reason that we also need to put the emphasis on the solutions which can actually shift out the fossil economy in order to scale them uh, faster. That's great. Now yes. you're in the right place because as the flywheel shows it's, you know, not anything that we're pushing down anyone's throat, solutions and answers and all these things, but can you build out with a little bit more definition about what this framework is? Yeah, and the reason uh, if we should be able to recognize these companies and incentivize companies, we need some kind of independent framework. That's a background. Uh, so we can also validate, is this a climate solution or a climate solutions company? And that's the reason why we started this uh, job, maybe, I think it was one to two years ago, mm. together with Oxford, uh, Net Zero, Kaya is here, and some other partners. So we have also quite thoroughly, thoroughly reviewed this uh, particular uh, framework to put it uh, into place and uh, re released the first version quite uh, recently. And it's the basic principle, it actually follow the scientific carbon law, which was defined by Johan Rockström 2017. So to, to be able to qualify as a climate solution, you need to have a significant lower uh, carbon fo footprint through the life cycle compared to the market average solution. So we put the threshold as more than 50%, preferably 80, 90%, etc., to be able to, to define such a solution as a climate solution. In addition to that, it needs to follow strict guardrails, of course. And it's also so that companies 
also need to have net zero targets, intermediate targets and other basic principles in place. So it's important to keep it firm, but also with the idea of uh, simplicity. Great. Um, do you have any more slides actually showing the criteria? Let's have a look at those. Great. Let's have a quick look at the, that and then the following one as well. Yeah, so that, that's the basic principle that you have to stay under this particular curve. So of course, there is a ratcheting, ratcheting over time. So if you introduce a solution, let's say with 60% less carbon footprint over the complete life cycle, you still need to have reduction targets to stay under the curve yep. continuously. Yes. Right. And then the criteria for what makes up the different types of climate solutions. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, there are, these are a couple of examples. I won't go, go into that practically. But for example, um, an electrical vehicle might qualify as, as a climate solution, but it won't qualify uh, maybe in two or three years. It needs to be developed with, um, uh, with low fossil material or near zero steel. Uh, and it's also possibly need to be shared as well in order to follow that particular curve as an example. Mm -hmm. So it will continuously, we need to strengthen the criteria over time yeah. to follow the curve. So, and it's not just theoretical, is it? We've got um, Lena here from Stegra, and Stegra is um, the first company to qualify, I believe. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come to you in a moment and ask you about why you wanted to become um, a climate solutions uh, company. Uh, but, uh, Johan, now, is there an announcement that we would like to make today? Well, also, Oatly is joining the Exponential Roadmap Initiative. Oh. Which is that is fantastic. just brilliant. And a great, yeah, so we just announced that. Yeah, and which is first. focusing on providing uh, climate <laughs> solutions according to this uh, framework. Great. Yeah. Okay. So that is fabulous. Thank you for setting us up with the foundations, Johan. So, um, Caroline, I'm going to go to you. As the, as the, as the newest company on the block uh, with this status, why did you want to qualify as a climate solutions company? Great question. So um, We didn't rehearse this. No, we didn't. <laughs> um, but let's just start with, firstly, Oatly, we make oat milk. Um, we are a purpose-led company. Um, our mission is to make it easier for people to eat well and live healthy lives without recklessly taxing the planet's resources. So simply put, it can't be healthy for you if it's not healthy for the, the planet. Um, and we believe that our product, our oat milk, is a mechanism of change, changing the food system for the better. Um, but we can have the belief that we think our product's a mechanism for change, it's so much better than cow's milk, but having now been assessed by the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, which is a partner of the UN Race to Zero, um, against this criteria, and kind of having that um, stamp of approval that we, our products, our oat milk, our climate solutions in the category of milk, it just really brings us like kind of really good uh, credibility. And so what it actually means is depending on the market and where we are selling our oat milk, our oat milk is between uh, 51 to 73 percent less impactful than the market, and that's the milk market. So it's not compared to cow's milk, it's comparing ourselves to cow's milk and actually other plant-based alternatives in the market today. So um, we really feel like that's a really first step in providing that um, credibility. And we're also really happy to be engaged um, in this discussion around climate um, frameworks and the climate solutions companies and products, because today, to, we are a climate have climate solutions products and they need to scale at speed if we are to reach net zero. And um, to do that, we're high growth. And that also means that our absolute emissions in the short term are probably going to increase as we displace cow's milk. Um, and so we really also really like that the um, framework is acknowledging the need um, for intensity reduction targets to make space for the growth needed for climate solutions products and companies. 
So, um, hold that thought. Kai, when I come to you, I'm going to ask you to expand on that, if, if I may. Um, but first of all, Lena, over to you. Why did you want to become um, a climate solutions company? And can you expand a bit on some of the benefits you might have seen? Like, do your customers care? Are they interested? Yeah, for sure. And perhaps I should start with telling what Stegra is, because yes. uh, a lot of you might not know, but uh, uh, our name uh, up until last week was H2 Green Steel. And we are starting the first green steel mill in the world, actually, building it right now uh, up in the northern part of Sweden. And in this mill, we will produce 2.5 million tons of green steel, which has 95% lower emissions compared to the traditional steel making route. So that's a lot, a lot less emissions. Uh, and of course, it's really important for us to be able to advocate this and also, of course, to get uh, the investments needed to be able to build this factory. And our investors, they have raised concern, of course. They say, ah, why aren't you uh, SBTI? Why, why don't you have targets? Well, we have 95% lower emissions. Uh, that's a target. <laughs> uh, but this stamp, with the being a, a climate solution company registered with the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, is. Uh, a clear evidence for our investors that we are contributing in a substantial way. That's great. That's fabulous to hear. And have you found similarly, do your do, do customers, are they interested? Is it something you're getting asked about? Yeah, great question. First, customers, we don't mean people, consumers. Consumers yeah. don't care about climate solutions. Con consumers want delicious, tasty um, upgrades in their life and their diet. <laughs> but when we talk about customers, we are a supplier to big retailers around the world that sell products to then you. They also um, often request that customers should ha be, um, have SBTI um, uh, climate reduction targets. Um, and so that doesn't work for us either because we also want to grow similarly to H2 Green Steel. So again, it's really great to be having this um, space and this acknowledgement that um, yeah, there is, this, there, is a, there is another type of company that is challenging the status quo and um, there is space for that and we really hope that customers start to, start to understand the impacts, the positive impacts we can have for them. Right. Um, some of the favourite emails I've seen in recent years has been when our corporate partners, hello, welcome, oh. I will introduce you in a moment. Sure, That's thank very good, so thank you so much. Um, when our corporate partners have shared the emails that they've had from procurement teams saying, I'd like to explain why you haven't set your near-term science-based target yet. It's like, oh, it's coming from procurement, that is fantastic. <laughs> but to give another framework to have that questioning on, I think is great. Yes. Um, okay, so um, please do welcome Zainab B. Have I pronounced your name? Yes, it's correct. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. And Zainab, you're the Asia-Pacific Campaign Manager of Equal Rights. Yes. So we've just been getting going with a bit of a definition and foundations about the solutions framework and um, Stegra and Oatly, who's the newest climate solutions company. I've just been talking about why they wanted to join. And Kaya, I'll turn to you and then to Zainab. Um, give us a little bit about um, what, what you see the importance of this framework and what it can unlock and why we need a definition such as this. Yeah, so why name Climate Solutions? And first yeah. of all, congratulations. <laughs> yes, yeah, thank you. And thank you both for the work that you do. Thank you all for the work that you do. Um, there, I'm looking over at Abe Lincoln. The best way to predict the future is to create it. There is some evidence that shows when you name something, you can actually create an identity. Um, censusing is a good example of this. There are examples of times when a census names a group of people and then a previously um, uh, not known identity yeah. was created as a result of that in the population. And what we're trying to do is create the identity of a client climate solutions provider so that companies can live that um, as part of their wholesale business model strategy. And we need business model innovation from brown to, to green and also green startups. And so those are the two types of climate solutions that we defined in this framework. The other reason that we needed to define uh, climate solutions is because of some really exciting innovations in the standards and policy landscape. We're, I just came from an event, um, which is why I rushed in here excited, because there's amazing work going on thinking about how we meet our net zero targets and thinking about how we're probably going to need to band together, especially on scope three, through these value chain initiatives. 
and these value chain initiatives will be um, d are aggregating demand and investing specifically in uh, green products that probably come with a green premium. Now, if all of this effort is going into creating a transition finance market to decarbonize value chains, but we don't have good definitions for what those products are, then we've wasted quite a lot of energy. And so we need to have very high quality standards at a sector level as to what a climate solution is, but we thought we would start at a general level with this framework. Fab. And actually, Zainab, if I may, I'm going to quickly go to Piera, because I know, Piera, in terms of that, you were talking about the need for this for financial institutions. So please expand on that and tell us anything else in terms of why we need this type of definition right now. Yes. Well, first of all, I mean, well, I, I come from SPTI, uh, which was nominated multiple times here, but um, the mission of SPTI is to actually help uh, corporates, but also financial institutions setting uh, target that are aligned with science uh, and also to educate companies uh, and financial institutions to uh, understand what actually can they can do in order to um, reach these targets um, and I think that's where we see the role of uh, climate solution and we see how important is the definition of climate solution I was actually talking just just now about the fact that Climate solution is now becoming a brand, like the, ter the term itself. Like I I'm an engineer as a background, and I used to call these low carbon technologies, low carbon products. But the fact that now also SBTI in its the consultation draft of the uh, financial institution net zero standard now will ask financial institution to green their portfolio by investing in climate solution. It's it's very powerful, and so I think the, the framework is going to be very important and. and I'm really looking forward to see also how this will evolve over time because I think it's going to be crucial also to take into account the ecosystems where all of these different climate solutions operate because we are talking about green steel and oat milk, like very different products. They have very different challenges. Um, and so it's going to be very important to, as, as, as we mentioned, to evolve this framework over time. Yeah, that's good. Well, we will come back to that. So again, hold that thought. Um, Zainab, I'm going to turn to you. If you wouldn't mind um, introducing yourself a little bit and tell us about where you see the need for this climate so solutions definition and again, what you can see it unlocking. Yes, thank you so much for having me here. I'm Zainab B. I'm leading the Asia Pacific Campaign Manager Management for an organization called Equal Right. And what we're trying to do is basically how do we solve the problem of inequality and climate change together. So a lot of our work goes into mobilizing climate finance for the global south. Now the issue arises, uh, even though the money is coming very uh, with a lot of difficulty, even if we mobilize it, how do we make sure that we are funding the right projects? And here the climate solutions come into place. And we do go by, uh, by the vision that the more you define something, the better you will be able to solve it. Uh, let us just take the example of climate finance. The UNFCCC framework is still not able to define it. And look at us now. We are yet to mobilize the fund that we need for energy transition, and we are unable to do it. And even if we get the money, even if we are able to uh, mobilize the fund, $5 trillion um, for the Global South, how do we make sure that it goes to the right place? How do we make sure that the penetration is correct? How do we make sure that it reaches the right people and again the most vulnerable people those who really need it the most affected people and areas and how do we make sure that this transition happens in uh, as much redistributive manner as much, um, as much just manner so i think this is where uh, it is very important to define climate solutions I think that's just a fantastic build out of how it needs to be applied in the real world and linking to the need for a just transition. So thank you for that. And Kai, I'm going to bring you back in as well because I could see you nodding enthusiastically at that. And you mentioned before a couple of areas that we want to encourage climate solutions in. So I wonder if you could respond to Zainab and particularly that bit around the two types, the brown to green and the scaling um, green startups basically. 
Yeah, I'd love to tell a story about why I was motivated. In addition to Johan's incredibly persuasive invitation to work on this framework, he's clearly been thinking about for a long time. But for me, the light bulb came on as to why we needed this um, in reference to a just transition and an understanding of different um, development models and green development models. So I was working on the International Standard Organization's Net Zero Standard, and the chair of that standard um, process, Amasan, Toy, he said, you know, I'm not chairing this process unless we give a space to companies, particularly those from developing context, who want to be part of the green solution. Instead, we were just defining net zero as a reduction pathway and not a green growth opportunity. And when you're talking to a continent that represents less than 1% of global historical emissions, it's pretty tone deaf to say reduce alone. And so, I was a little late to this, but I listened over time, and um, it really is that which motivated uh, this framework, and I think can um, uh, hopefully enable a lot of um, excitement from all different political economies. Right. Absolutely great. <laughs> all right. So that's uh, kind of round one of the questions. Now we're going to have a we're going to have a, now we said solutions answers only, but we are going to look a little bit at the barriers um, before going on to the solutions. So. Johan, I'm going to go back to you. Um, we've identified um, some of the barriers already, financial, allocation of capital, et cetera. What are some of the other ones that we've got that are preventing this rapid scale to just climate solutions? And, and what can be some of the solutions to that? Yeah, one thing is obviously um, that we don't have the policies in place, of course. We have blocking policies which actually subsidize the, the, well, the fossil solutions and the business as usual solutions. So it's a big disadvantage for, for the new solutions which can radically uh, shift out the fossil economy. So that's, that's really a big, big blocker. And I think it's important that the companies of tomorrow, we get them around the table basically. Because today it's primarily the big existing companies which are around the table. And there is a risk, of course, that they like to protect, number one, protect their market share, obvious. Number two, say, well, it's impossible. You can't go that fast. That's impossible. I would say a lot is possible if you bring in the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the disruptors around the table and give them uh, a place and show actually what is achievable. So I would say, um, from a policy viewpoint, we need to bring in all these new companies, which has an opportunity to contribute to, to, to global net zero and show it is possible, actually. And it's so important as part of this value chain transformation, Kaya, that you talked about, because it's all now about value chain transformation to achieve net zero upstream and downstream. You need to get the innovators in there. You can't just rely on your existing suppliers and customers. You need to sort of break up your value chains, go for rapid rethinking. So there are a couple of arguments. Great, absolutely fab. And arguably it is what business does best, yeah. is actually the entrepreneurial and the innovation approach rather than just the productionist approach. Piera, I'm gonna ask the same question to you, if I may. I'm, I'm gonna come back this way, so fair warning. <laughs> so I would absolutely echo what, what, what was just mentioned. Um, and I would also add that, again, I think one important thing to remember is also differentiation. Like what is important is to understand that there are some solutions that could work somewhere and that do not work in others. And so having this level of transparency also in this framework to understand like, um, for instance, that's also when we, when we talk about just transition, right? Um, green steel, it's, could, like it's fundamental and can work in a region like Sweden where you have access to low carbon energy and it can really work and you can bring all, all together, but it might not work in other countries. So I think having this level of, like really evolving this framework to understand all of the different complexity and the barriers that I think, I still think they are kind of like very specific also to the different solution, it's, it's gonna be very important. Because there might be that some product actually do not need that much capital, right? It's more about social acceptance, what other really require investment to be locked, yeah. locked unlocked. Yeah. 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 Okay. I totally agree. Um, Lena, I wonder if you could talk about the barriers and solutions, but 
If you're happy to, maybe share if you had any barriers inside the business about adopting this framework and any solutions to that. I mean, if, if you're happy to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, what's most important for us to be able to kick off our investment is actually policy, of course, and it's the carbon price. And in Europe, we have mm -hmm. uh, an emission trading scheme that hits us mm -hmm. as a heavy industry, steel sector, uh, and that is what, what makes this investment possible. Uh, however, to your point, you want we have really seen that the incumbents, they have tried to hinder this price signal <coughs> market. And now, 15 years after we launched the emission trading scheme, now we have a price that actually makes investments viable. So we really do need to get the, the, the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the, the scale-ups into the policy discussions. And I think that's one, uh, one important uh, part for us to be part in exponential roadmap initiative as well. because. Uh, uh, today, we only see the, the incumbents and their federations and organizations around the table, and they tend to, to make it uh, not as ambitious as we would want to. Yes, that pressure is real. Yeah. Okay, great call out. Caroline. Yes, so for us, uh, it's all about empowering a plant-based revolution. We need the food system to change, and that's not a small feat. I mean, one, the food system, one-third of all emissions, half of that from um, the animal-based sector. Um, we all need to eat. Um, food is also very um, cultural. It's, uh, we are often, it's, it's part of our identity. Um, so we have a lot to um, achieve going forward. Um, Policy, regulation, nutritional guidelines, school food, it was all developed for another era. And that's the past, before things like climate change were thought about. And so, I mean, our biggest barrier is really policy changing that actually um, is future, um, looking forward and taking into account both nutritional and environmental um, needs um, and it's about coming together and we are up against really big incumbents um, the meat and dairy industry there's been some really interesting um, papers published recently speaking about you know their how they are kind of derail deny deploy and how they're fighting against climate action so we are we are up against a big machine uh, so coming together with other like-minded companies is what we need to do Oatly ourselves has we're quite small but we actually have a very large voice and so we do everything from uh, advocating for climate labeling because you should be able to know the impact of the foods you choose. Um, it might not steer your choices, but at least um, uh, you should be aware so you can make conscious uh, decisions um, to all the way to kind of challenging the dairy industry on big billboards and being fun about it. Um, but it's really about using our voice to, um, to challenge the outdated um, landscape, the, the policy landscape and um, industrial landscape that we're facing. And you do use all of your real estate on your packs to do that as well, don't you? Yes. In an amusing way. Yes. Um, okay, Kaya. Uh, ba barriers that you see in solutions that this climate solutions framework can, can bring? I don't think that we have, I mean, to your point about policy, subsidies are almost all pointing in unhealthy directions for planet and people. Um, we have, uh, I guess, this is on us, as people who work on standards and policy, we've yet to help companies set KPIs um, and a percentage of their um, products and services that they sell to be climate solutions. And I don't know how we think we're going to get to you know, 100% or close to 100% emission reduction without also scaling up those services, because you know, your, what you're selling is someone else's scope one or two. So, um, so yeah, I think... It, it has, um, I like to think about what we can do. And so what, what I'm working on is helping the companies that I do research with and talk to regularly set those targets and then they'll buy from each other as well. Um, and also I think working on the standards um, so that we can really encourage it and put that like, I think incredibly positive frame on the climate yeah, movement. Yeah, it's great. I love that building the community of practice through your work and encouraging everyone to buy from each other. That's great. Um, Zainab, could you tell us um, about some of the solutions that you can, barriers and solutions that you can see? For sure. So to give a bit of, a bit of more context about the kind of work we are trying to do, so we are coming up with a policy solution called cap and share, very different from cap and trade. 
Again, the idea is to charge the carbon. According to IP, IPCC, it should be $135 per ton of carbon dioxide emissions. So, and kind of try to mobilize funds to use it within the Global South for the transition. And uh, in 2023 itself, within Asia Pacific, there were around 8 million people who were directly affected by the climate crisis through storms, through hazards. And yes, it is still not convincing enough to get the finance for these countries for rep as a reparation, as transition. So having this will help us build the credibility. Yes, the money is going the right way. And again, it will help us get the money towards the Global South, help us fund those renewable projects and our infrastructure again, because we are still in, in a very developing stage. We are still working on our infrastructure. We do not want to do it wrong again. But then again, the, one of the barriers I see is definitely corruption. Within the Global South, uh, within the go governance structure, there have been many instances of corruption and it has been difficult to navigate the governance structure and reaching the right people and reaching the right projects. So this could be another issue. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, I'm going to throw it open to the floor. So we've got a little bit of time for questions and also panelists. We can also ask questions from each other as well. But let's get some, have we got the roving mic uh, going around, uh, tech team? Thank you so much. And anyone want to want to ask a question, you might be at the start of your journey and thinking, can, can I do this? With, uh, you know, any tips on becoming a climate solutions company? You might want to ask from our broad range of academic and practitioners. So any hands up? Otherwise, Kaya, we're going to be asking each other questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, over here, thank you. Right. <coughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I'm Tyler Cole. I'm director of climate solutions at TESS. We're an e-fuel producer that's both a climate startup and transitioning brown to green industries with low carbon gases. My question is for Oatly and is it Stegra? I apologize. I knew it as H2, <laughs> green steel before. Um, what's the expectation, the process of joining this group and maybe for Jan as well? What's the plan for the future as more and more companies look to... Um, I don't know, is it a certification? Is it something that, what's the expectation of startups that want to join? Yeah, yeah, I can go first. Uh, from our side, we hope uh, that we will get a lot of attraction to this and uh, more companies joining, of course, because uh, one voice is not loud enough. We need to be several. Uh, and Johan, you're working on the new framework and the certification uh, process. So there are clear guidelines what you need to achieve to be able to join. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Feel the same. And then just maybe building on, there's also, I really like that the framework's built up that, you know, by 2030, you need to be at least 50% less impactful, but then the guidance is 75% less impactful, and then 90 by, so it's really giving you that pathway, so internally you can really be building your roadmaps to, if you want to continue to be a climate solution going ahead, which was what we were doing at um, Oatly. So I can, ask, I can add to that. Yeah. So we, we started to validate the framework with the concrete companies. So prior to that, we did the review and review. And um, we also, when we decided for the first version, I would say we come for simplicity because some of the feedback from the actors was, if you do it too complicated, it will not fly. We will not be able to scale it. So there is a fine balance between sharpness and simplicity, and also speed, that we need to get things out and start to test it to get feedback to applying an agile approach, which is our, our thinking. We think it's pretty solid, yes. Is it perfect? No, probably not, absolutely not. But our thinking is we take in the companies, we, we validate according to these principles, which are pretty sharp as far as I would see it. And now we're looking at, of course, what is the feedback and how, how that could be developed over time if it requires uh, more capacity and so on. Yeah. So we are in the starting phase, I would say. But we also created a group of, of a number of uh, companies uh, just to be able to, uh, similar to St uh, Stig and Oatly, uh, which can actually provide feedback on implementation of the principles. And I do expect that we will, of course, tune it over time, but we need to keep certain stability as well. Yeah. But it's important with an in independent validation for a company, uh, because otherwise uh, the argument would be that you can claim anything. 
And the key point is, well, we following this framework, it doesn't say that it's perfect, but this needs to be transparent, basically. So anyone can criticize it or have a view on it if it's sufficiently sharp or if it's too sharp. Yeah, it's important to start, yeah. isn't it? It's important exactly, to get yeah. something out there. Did any of you want to come in on that as well, on the um, expectations for next steps? I just wanted to say how fantastic is it that our first question was how can I be a climate solutions company? <laughs> More of that please. And so I guess an ask for all of you, if you work for an organization, do you think it could be a climate solutions company? If not, why not? Will you go back to your organization and question that? And, and if not, um, do you think there's a potential that in a net zero world your products or services could be stranded? Um, I think this really ties to um, CSRD and the kind of regulatory reporting requirements that we're starting to see companies um, have to submit. And I know that those can be controversial because it's a burden to submit those, but the point is that it's an exercise to help companies look at not just the risk, but also the opportunity. And um, so this is not just in the land of many initiatives, like an initiative that is divorced from or contradictory to others. It's very much in line with regulation that should cover about 50% of jurisdictions around the world um, within the next few years. And it should actually, if you, if you tackle both of these things, they, actually, they, they, get, they help each other, don't they? You actually, taking a climate solutions approach is actually going to enable you and help you with your compliance requirements as well. So it's good to see it's all nested um, together. Uh, more questions? OK, we've got three here. Let me take three at once. Um, hi, my name is Cambria. Um, I'm a sustainability consultant working with food and beverage companies primarily, uh, Qantas. Um, I'm going to sneak in two questions, sorry. Um, so one is, I look forward to reading the framework in detail, but I'm seeing the one metric I'm see, I've seen so far is CO2E. Um, is nature uh, coming into the frame of evaluating a climate solutions product, a climate solutions company, yeah. um, because that's obviously integral and we're beyond the point of being able to look through carbon tunnel vision. Second question is I was really struck. I work with companies and help them set science-based targets all the time. Um, and I was really struck by hearing um, from you both a little bit of, uh, you know, maybe it's not feasible to set a near-term target because of high growth. Um, is this seen maybe as an alternative to setting a science-based target for a high-growth company? Yep. How do you make sure uh, you are indeed taking over market share, um, replacing, you know, dairy, for example? How are you taking, make, ensuring you're taking over market mm -hmm. share mm -hmm. uh, and not just adding to absolute emissions? Right. Okay, two great questions. We're going to keep going. We're going to gather all the questions. Good. Mm. Nature and high growth and an alternative to SBTI. Yeah. Hi, my name is Claire. I'm with First Matter. We do climate tech commercialization strategy. Um, my question is around how this relates to, or how companies, specifically Johan, I think you might be able to answer this, how companies who are not necessarily climate solutions focused, but they have products that they're launching that are climate solutions. We see this a lot with kind of large corporates that have certain divisions that are focused on climate solutions, how they would play into it, or do you look, do you look at the whole company? Yeah. Um, and it needs to be like a holistic assessment. So that's my question. That is great. So a, a product versus company approach and how that works. Thank you. These questions are great, everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah. Hi. Yeah, hi, my name is Lynn, and I'm also a decarbonization planning consultant. And I, um, I'm wondering about, uh, first of all, I work with a lot of businesses that do see the opportunity and the value of going low carbon in their products, and they're frustrated by the lack of standards, yeah. you know, to be able to, you know, define their product that way. So I applaud this discussion. This is great. Um, but I'm also wondering, out of the some of the existing mechanisms that are there, how does this um, exponential roadmap and other things play into uh, things like the um, uh, environmental product declarations yeah. and the North American library that's being built and, and some of the green buying and procurement standards that are already out there for government and businesses? Great. And another great question. So, um, Johanna, I'm going to start with you, and mm -hmm. if you could uh, start with the last question, if you don't mind, 
but also build out a little bit to how this sits within other frameworks. And then we'll go around um, the team with uh, the question on, you can, you can take nature as well if you want, because I know it is yeah. there. So why don't you take those two to start? Uh, that's really good questions. Uh, so we see this as complementary to other frameworks. It's of course uh, complementary to, to SPTI, particularly SPTI creates a very strong demand and pressure from particularly the large corporations to drive down their value chain emissions, which requires these type of solutions. So from that perspective, it is it is very complementary as far as I see it. We're not here talking about quantifying um, avoided emissions. There are other initiatives and framework looking into how many million tons you could avoid. So that's, that's also complementary as far as we see it. This is more about qualifying your solutions. And then of course you can look at taxonomy and some other frameworks, uh, which we also link to. Um, so there is a need, as we identified, that we should create that map of the frameworks, basically, and how they link to each other and how they complement each other. So that's definitely something we will do. We don't want to reinvent anything from our perspective. And then in the next phase, see, can we influence some of the standards depending on which direction it will take? So that is the thinking. And on the nature, yes, we started, of course, here with the climate as a leading. We're leading with climate. But in the guardrails, we're applying the similar principles uh, as from, um, uh, from the taxonomy in terms of guardrails regard, uh, related to nature. Yeah. It's a good point. It could be further developed. Yes. Right. I'm really sorry. I'm we're running out of time. I was like, we've got loads of questions yeah. from the audience. And then the really great questions, but it all sped up. So, Pierre, do you want to have a quick closing point on the SBTI and high growth piece? I mean, you are from SBTI, so I feel we should ask you the SBTI question. <laughs> no, well, first of all, I really appreciate what, what you just mentioned and the fact that I think we need to have complementary framework, right? SBTI cannot solve all the problems. Right, um, and it's it's very much welcome that we have more than one framework, and I think in an ideal world we can all align on this language and taxonomy because you know what we what we are trying to solve it's so so difficult and so challenging that uh, SPTI never had the uh, the presumption of being you know the solution, so that's great, and yeah, with regard to high growth company, I mean. The, what's the question? Do, shall I open up into the carbon budget? No, 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 no. Oh, sorry, right. we're, we're at time. Okay. We'll do another session on the carbon exactly. budget. Thank you, though, for checking. So, um, very quickly, Lena and Caroline on products versus um, versus whole company. So, do you also look at product certification, or have you taken the whole company approach with this? Um, so, we did both when we we've done the assessment recently, and um, right now we looked at the the product because um, we're in the process of working out our long term um, reduction targets. Net zero, which means we couldn't be the, the company. Hopefully, we will be. So it works for both company and and product. Right. Um, yeah, and I just want to add, I think it's also really important, even though it's not covered in the climate um, uh, solutions framework, I think it's really important as a company, as ours, with a purpose, to be able to really actually see, are we actually having that positive impact in the world? So we are doing avoided emissions based on a methodology developed with you at Qantas. Well, <laughs> there we are. Right. Lena, did you want to quickly cover that one? No, no, for, for us as a company, it's, it's yeah. only for the company. Yeah. Right. Nothing else matters. Kaya, I saw you noting down which of the questions you want to take. Um, the green procurement one. Yeah. Uh, right. We did actually speak with Ceres, who is working on the two green procurement bills that have advanced, and they really liked this. This, but I think I need to check if they incorporated it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. We have an action point from this panel, which is always really useful. Um, and Zainab, uh, is the, do you want to take any of the questions around green procurement and how that might? Sit? Uh, I'm, I'm more interested in the product versus Please, company. Yeah. So again, the majority of the companies <laughs> now are more interested in solving about are you on the right track or are we on the right path? But the correct question should be, are, is the pace correct? And considering the situation right now, we actually do not have time. So I guess it would be much better to focus on products. And then it will also eliminate a lot of greenwashing that is happening. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had whole sessions on yeah. that as well. <laughs> uh, all right. Can we please give the panelists an enormous round of applause?